Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, apologies for the slightly late delay. We've just been working with some technical issues. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this joint IPNA ISPD webinar. Um, it's looking at PD for acute kidney injury in pediatrics. And it's an incredibly important topic because, as we know, in most low, low middle income countries, acute kidney injury predominantly affects children. And PD is obviously an incredibly useful modality for treating these, these children with AKI compared to hemodialysis or um, CRRT. So I'm very grateful for IPNA and ISPD for putting together this webinar so that we can, we can explore this issue. And the Saving Young Lives program, which is a joint venture between IPNA, ISPD, ISN, and EuroPD, we set about to try and develop kidney injury um, programs where we can treat children in low middle income countries with acute PD. And one of the problems with it was that there was very little data as to how to do this. And so part of the program has been to put together the ISPD guidelines for PD and AKI. And they were originally produced in, in 2015 and have recently been updated. And this webinar is going to look at these, these guidelines. And I'm very glad that we've got Peter Norse to present, um, these, present these guidelines. Peter's an associate professor at the University of Cape Town at Red Cross Children's Hospital. He's an advisor to the Saving Young Lives Committee. He has done a lot of work and is a pioneer in continuous flow PD for uh, PD and AKI in children um, and has published widely on this along with, with many other areas in, in pediatric nephrology. So we're very grateful to have Peter here talking about this. And he's the primary author of the ISPD guidelines for PD and AKI. We're going to follow on from this with Professor Samson Antwi. Um, Samson is a professor um, at the, the, the Kwame Nkrumah University in Kumasi in Ghana. He's also um, he's the, the head of the Department of Pediatric Nephrology, but also the Vice Dean of the School of Medicine. Um, he's a co-chair of the AFRAN PD Committee um, for the African Association of Nephrology. And Samson's done a huge amount of work um, setting up PD and AKI service um, in Kumasi, but also showing us how you can save a number of lives, but also teach others how to do it. And so Samson's going to speak after Peter and, and show us how we can put this all into practice. Following on from this, we're going to have a Q&A session, which, as you know, often are the, the, the most important parts of these webinars. We'll have 20 minutes for questions, so please can I ask you to put your questions into the question box on the right-hand side, you'll see on the control panel. If you're unable to find that, you can also put them in the chat function, and I'll put those questions to our two speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to call on Peter to give us uh, the first talk on the PD, ISPD guidelines for PD and AKI. Thank you, Briggs. Um, so I work at Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town, and uh, we do up to about 50, we know there's about 40 PD, acute PDs a year. We have a PD first policy, so um, most of our acute dialysis is done with PD. Um, so the question is, is PD still a popular modality in children in the rest of the world? Well, this was a, um, a survey, um, international survey on, on pediatric dialysis modalities done by uh, Rapesh Rainer a few years ago. And this is looking mainly at um, centers in North America, about 200 centers in North America and Asia. And what they found in, in this survey is that surprisingly, um, not surprisingly, PD is uh, very popular in developing countries, especially in infants. You can see 68% in infants, but in, in developed countries, and this is in North America, only 5.7% of patients, uh, infants were treated with PD. Um, surprisingly, what the most common uh, modality in, in, in uh, North American countries was uh, HD, which is 72% of the patients. Um, in, the older, in the older age groups, um, which is kind of even with HD and uh, PD being kind of, sort of equal, um, and PD was available in 100% of all the centers, so they developed under developing countries. Um, and HD was um, most used in the, in the older age group, even in the developed, in the developing low, low income countries. Um, in contrast to this, this was a survey done um, and published last year, I mean in 2019, um, of 
there are 35 um, countries in, in Europe, and it was a survey um, looking at, at dialysis use in, a, in acute kidney injury. And um, I think you can't see my spine, there we go. And so what you can see here is that in Europe, at least the um, PD and uh, CRT were equally used, with HC being um, less, less used. And this was in, a, in about 900 pediatric patients. So still popular in, in Europe and um, not so much in North America. And this is a um, systematic review of uh, studies that were done in, in African countries, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see from this that the most used um, modality in, in pediatrics in this is laser era, even though less than, be than before, was 77%. Um, so mainly used in African countries as well, in children. So, so PD is um, the suitable modality for AKI. So there's a long track record, the, the records going back now, right down to 1949. It's less technologically demanding and cheaper. Um, it's been shown to be safe in cardiovascular instability, and you can institute it rapidly at the bedside with catheters. It's also um, very suitable in small babies where central, central access is difficult, like especially very low birth weight babies. Um, it's often the most um, the preferred modality in post cardiac surgery, even in high income countries. Um, if you've got coagulation problems, it's very useful because you're not having to access big veins to get, to get access. And it's quite useful if you really want to restrict that baby's uh, fluid intake, but you worry about the glucose. You obviously get glucose in the belly, so this is uh, quite a useful modality for that. So one thing in pediatrics is you remember that the periods, we've got a much better dialyze in children than we have in adults. Um, and this is because of the increased peritoneal surface area of the body weight. So in infants, it's almost double that of, of adults. And also there's an increased capillary density um, in children, especially under one year of age. So we've got a, we've got a better um, dialyzer in children than adults. So what about outcome modality? So um, the problem with um, outcome modality studies is that first of all, there was no standardized AKI definition until quite recently. Um, and the indication to prescribe a modality is often depend on local expertise, availability, and clinical safety of the patient. Um, and often there's changing modalities in the same patient. Um, and prospectively, there's, often, there's a paucity of the patients and there's an ethical issues um, with randomized control studies. So if you look around the world, these are, um, this is the survival of peritoneal dialysis or uh, mortality from around the world. And you can see it varies from 20% um, in Denmark to 56% in, in, um, in Turkey. But you don't really know what kind of patients these were, and you can, they're not really easy to compare to each other, these studies. Um, if you look at the survival of CRT, so this is um, from the CRT registry, which was closed in 2005, and you can see that um, over the years, the survival also hasn't changed. It's still the, um, the survival is 56%, so similar to what we saw in the PD studies, um, it does vary between sort of subgroups in this um, database with patients with liver transplant doing well and the smaller patients also doing less well than the older patients. And so that doesn't really tell us much. Um, in a few patients, in a few studies where there's actually been a um, comparison, these are all retrospective studies. And um, actually, interestingly enough, you can see that in the study by Bunchman and Krauser, the modality that had the highest survival was actually hemodialysis. But in the, the discussion of these studies, um, it, it's been said that these patients were actually the, the, the less sick patients. The patients that are getting CRT and PD were often on inotropes and were much, much sicker than the patients getting HD, um, which explains the, the more, the higher morta um, lower mortality in the HD patients. So the problem with retrospective studies comparing different modalities, modalities are they're affected by the choice of the modality according to the severity of the illness and the characteristics of the patient. So very hard to compare one modality to each other. This is quite an interesting study um, came from in India, where well, 136 children a retrospective study comparing hemodialysis to peritoneal dialysis and to kidney injury. And what you can see here is that the risk of death was 75% higher in the hemodialysis patients. So opposite to what other studies we saw. Um, and this was after multi jurist analysis. And, but what was found in the study was that most of the deaths in hemodialysis 
I could talk to you after HC or actually during HC, and there were multiple episodes of hypertension. So this, what this says to me is that, um, because I know in, in, in many of my African colleagues, they, they have adult hemodialysis equipment, but not pediatric hemodialysis equipment. And because of the large extracorporeal blood volumes um, and the high dialysis rate, the, the patients are very unstable. So I think what this teaches me that in, in, in the places where you haven't got pediatric equipment for CRMC or HC, it's better to, to do PD. Um, you look at the adult data, um, all the randomized controlled trials and the uh, um, systematic review, basically there's no difference between mortality and adults, um, uh, between PD and um, hemodialysis or CRFT. So in summary, um, peritoneal dialysis is a suitable renal replacement therapy modality for treatment of children with acute kidney injury. Um, but the, the dialysis modality, the choice of modality is based on local expertise, available resources and the patient's clinical status. So what about peritoneal access? So these are in the guidelines. Um, we still believe that the uh, surgically placed Tinkoff is probably the best option. Uh, Tinkoff placed in theatre by a surgeon. Um, and this can be placed by an open surgical technique or laparoscopic technique or, or placed by the cardiac surgeon during cardiac surgery. And these are all equally effective. The problem with this is that um, this has a cost to it. In low-income countries, this is a problem, and also access to theatre time, which is probably the more of a problem. Um, so the guidelines say that um, placing a catheter with a cell digging technique at the bedside is a perfectly um, acceptable alternative to surgically placed catheters. And this, is this is what we do. So these catheters can be the um, these cook catheters, which are soft uh, catheters placed with a cell digging technique. These multi-purpose cook catheters are becoming more and more popular, and this is what we use at Red Cross Hospital now. Um, they come in a number of sizes, five or six, which we use in below birth weight babies or, pre or, or neonates, and in the 8.5 and older and even bigger children, we can use 10 and, and 12 French catheters. Um, another alternative is to place a tank of catheter at the bedside using a, um, a, a peel or a sheet technology. And so this can be done um, some days, uh, some of my colleagues actually still tunnel these because we really hard to tunnel them in small babies. Um, or you can just uh, place a tank off without a tunneling. Um, and that's what we can reuse. So we often use these bedside catheters and um, we, can get, we can get dialysis up and going within 20 minutes in, in our ICU. Um, and you can imagine this is far more preferable for waiting for hours for a surgeon to take a child to to theatre and to finally get the catheter going, especially when you have a high potassium. Um, one thing that's giving PD a, a bad name um, in acute dialysis is uh, peritonitis. Um, and this is one of our fellows inserting a catheter at the bedside. And um, as you can see, she's donned up in, in full uh, theatre guard. And I think this is extremely important to actually treat, even if you're putting the catheter up in the ICU, you need to get dressed up as if you are in theatre. Um, we also recommend giving antibiotic uh, prophylaxis at, at 60 minutes before inserting the catheter. catheter. And, and the choice of antibiotics is mainly used to cover positive, gram positive organisms, although some people would like to cover gram negative organisms as well because of viral perforation, possibly. So these rigid uh, catheters um, have been given a grade of minimum standard. Minimum standard is is, a, is because these guidelines are also written from low income countries, we have this minimal standard, um, which is when we other modalities are not available, but we still feel that this is worth um, using um, when to save lives when other modalities are not available. So these type of rigid cats are used a lot in, in Asian countries, um, but they're not recommended unless you haven't got other cats available because they've been shown to have a high leak uh, frequency, a high peritonitis rates, and they um, cause viscous damage. Um, and they definitely they shouldn't be kept in for longer than two to three days. But they certainly save lives, and if you, that's all you've got, that's what you should use. This is a, um, a picture of a child receiving peritoneal dialysis using intercostal drain in Nigeria, um, done by my friend Chris Accessible. Um, and other improvised catheters are nasogastric tubes or urethral catheters. And although these may be life-saving, um, there's little evidence for their use, so they have, have a minimum, they, they get a rating of a minimum standard and a practice point. 
which means there's not, not much um, evidence for these factors. But if that's all you've got, again, that's what you should use. If you're um, using a, a manual dialysis, which is what we recommend in children under five uh, kilograms generally, um, it's very important to have Buretol so that you can measure the input and the output really accurately. And also preferably to have a closed system. Um, so uh, there's a number of commercial systems. This is a PDP system, um, which by Fresenius, which is what we use. There's also a Baxter system and a daily Nate system, which is in America, which I haven't used, but that is apparently more procedural for old, slightly older children. Um, before we had this uh, PDP system, we used to actually improvise and do our dialysis using um, a system similar to this, where we used to use improvised fluid. We used to have a three-way tap using giving sex, uh, IV giving sex, and sort of, and then, and then a, 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 a makeshift uh, collection bag. And we used to use these, um, this combination of things to sort of improvise. And we used this for many years very successfully. Um, so if you haven't got um, those systems, you can actually use this one. Uh, what about alternate systems? Well, they, it's certainly less intensive um, for the nursing. They do come with a cost problem, and um, the dead space can be a problem. So we don't recommend that you use automated systems if you're having a full volume of less than 100 mils. Um, so the, the prescription is the same as in manual, um, and the options are really the home choice of the Fresenius system. What about fluids? So fluids, um, all the commercially available fluids are, are available and are, are suitable for acute peritoneal dialysis. There aren't specific fluids for acute peritoneal dialysis. They, um, there might be a, an argument for making a specific fluids for them, but they aren't available yet. Um, Lactate-based fluids are, can be used very effectively. In children where there is um, liver dysfunction or non correcting acidosis or hemodynamic instability, there's an argument uh, for using bicarbonate-based fluid because the liver um, cannot convert the lactate into bicarbonate. Um, so that's been given a 1D um, recommendation. Um, we generally add potassium to the bags once the potassium is below 4 millimoles per litre. Um, and if you're not able to measure the electrolytes, um, then we recommend that you actually just generally add potassium to the bags after 12 hours of doing dialysis and you add 4 millimoles per litre. Other added tips are heparin, um, which we put in standard for every patient. Some people only put that in for once if you have fibrin problems. Um, and if, they, if a child is hyponatremic, um, we actually add, and this is a, in the discussion in the, in the, recommend, in the guidelines, is to add sodium up to within 15 millimoles of the blood sodium. And this is not to, in order not to bring the sodium down too quickly. This is just to show you that um, if you're in a place where, and I know many places in Africa cannot get hold of commercially available peritoneal dialysis fluids. So, we are on the, in the top three rows uh, are the commonly available um, IV solutions. And you can see, um, compared to the bottom three rows, that the constituents of these fluids are very similar to commercially available um, dialysis fluids. And if you, um, in, the, in the guidelines, there are recipes in how to convert. So basically, you just need to add a certain amount of glucose to these fluids, and you can make a perfectly adequate dialysis fluid, which we also use for many years. And the prescription um, of PD in, in acute PD in children, we usually use a full volume of 10 to 20 mils per kilogram. So you just start with that, and then you can, you can go up to 30 to 40 mils per kilogram um, if it's tolerated and if there's no leak, or 800 to 1,100 mils per meter squared. Um, generally, we run the first cycle in one to 10 minutes. So especially the first time you run it in, you need to run it in slowly to see that it doesn't have an effect on ventilation. Um, the dwell time is usually 40 to 60 minutes, and the drain time is 20 minutes. So that seems quite long, but actually with the small uh, catheters, we find you actually do need that drain to, to get a proper arch-filtration. Um, then that's making short, shorter dwells. Um, and if you've got potassium problems, then we recommend doing fast cycles of 15 to 30 minutes per cycle. Um, there's not a lot of evidence for this, but that's what we recommend and that's what we do. 
Um, and then we also recommend that uh, peritoneal dialysis is continued continuously for the first one to three days. After that, the patient's stable, you can um, you, you can may shorten the time time that you do dialysis during the day. Um, and the new guidelines also we've also got is um, a whole section on troubleshooting in acute PD, and this is a, a, a new a new part of the guidelines. So if you get a, a blocked catheter, um, first thing to do, and we're talking mainly about the uh, solving in certain uh, uh, peritoneal valves, that is one of the soft ones that you put in the bed. The first thing is to make sure um, the bladder and the bowel are empty, like in chronic peritoneal dialysis. Um, the next thing is you can try flushing the catheter with heparin and saline. The trick is not to pull back on the catheter, because if you pull back, you often suck debris or, or bowel into the catheter. Um, if a fibrin clot is suspected, you can add tissue clad monitoring. There's some uh, evidence for this. Um, so you can add TPA in a mixture of one milligram per mil. Sorry, uh, one milligram per mil. And you can inject, um, inject the, the volume of the catheter in, into the patient and leave it for an hour and then take it out. Um, the other option is you might have to just replace the catheter over a guide wire in the same position or insert a new catheter in a different position. Generally speaking, we can manage this, uh, this problem quite well. Um, what happens if you get a pericatheter leak? Um, the first thing is to reduce the full volumes if it's possible. Um, then you can consider a time off peritoneal dice. In other words, less than 24 hours, you can, um, in addition to a reduction in the full volume, I don't find this very effective and also not very suitable because most of the time the patients actually need dialysis, so you don't want to, to do that. Um, the other option is that you replace the catheter over the guide wire in the same position with a large gauge catheter. So this, this is where these multi-purpose cook catheters that I showed you earlier, where they come in a whole lot of different gauges, are coming quite useful because you can then say have a replace a six French with an eight French or ten French if you're using an eight French. And another option, this has been shown in chronic peritoneal dialysis, but also in acute peritoneal dialysis is to actually infuse fibrin glue between the catheter and the tunnel wall and reuse this number of times successfully to, to stop a leak. Um, and if this doesn't work, then you may, may need to insert a new catheter in a different position. So what happens if you get low alteration? Um, first thing is to rule out access issues or peritoneal leak. Um, the next thing what you can do is increase the glucose concentration from 1 to 2 to 4%. Um, may increase the exchange frequency by, by reducing the dwell time by plus minus 25%. And if you can, you can try and reduce the, 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 the fill and drainage time depending on well, how, how well the catheter is flowing. Um, and then also, if that's not working, you might try increasing the fill volumes to 30 to 40 mils per kilogram or 800 to 1,100 mils per meter squared. And another thing to try is to try and continuous flow peritoneal dialysis. So, uh, what about dialysis dose? In, in the new adult recommendations, and Brett might tell you about this, is that you, um, they, they target a weekly case area of 2.2, and that, that has been shown to be equivalent to higher doses. In pediatrics, there's no studies correlating dose to outcome parameters in CPD, so therefore there are no target clearances that can be set. Um, in, in pediatric dialysis, we tend to use small volumes, as you can see, sometimes 10 to 20 mils per kilogram. So there is potentially a problem with getting clearance. But as I explained to you before, we've actually got a much more effective dialyzer because of the um, surface area to weight ratio. And then in a few studies that have been done um, measuring clearance um, with the kind of volumes that we're using, um, actually a case here will be up to 4.8 uh, and, and really crafting clearance up to 75 liters. So, Actually, I think even with our small uh, volumes, we actually are probably doing fine. Um, just to, to show you, this is how continuous peritoneal dialysis works. It's um, when you have a fixed full volume, and then you circulate fluid at a continuous, continuously through the abdomen. Um, so fluid comes in here to a pump or by gravity, and then out, out over here. Um, and this is a, as you can see in this picture, there's a patient here with using two peritoneal dialysis catheters and using an old BM25 mach machine to, um, where we use the pumps to um, circulate the fluid through the, um, through the, the peritoneum. 
Um, and using this technique, if you, um, we showed in this study that uh, we actually had increased clearances and ultrafiltration about three times as much as with conventional dialysis. We're actually currently doing a study where we've actually just finished collecting the data using just gravity because the pumps are quite expensive. So we want to make it available in developed countries, developing countries or low income countries. Um, and as you can see, we've tried different uh, with the, we're using the pumps, we use 100 moles to 1.73 um, moles per minute, um, which is quite a fast rate. We tried a lower, uh, much lower flow rate of 25, and then we kind of set it on a, a rate of 50. And 50 seems to give you pretty good clearances, uh, almost three times as much, and ultrafiltration as much as conventional dialysis. Um, and this still is going to be published in the study. If you get a pleural effusion, and this seems this is quite common in um, in post cardiac patients, because of the way they put in your right hand side, you can see um, some of the techniques using cardiac surgeons. Are often, they will sometimes breach the diaphragm with the catheter, and um, because of that, they more they seem to get uh, fluid leaking into the lungs um, more commonly. Um, and this is a relative contraindication for dialysis. So if you um, if you have this, you might want to try another diet. Dialysis but more often than not, what we will do is we'll put a chest strain in and test for glucose. I mean, we need to drain the fluid anyway, so they usually put a chest strain in the ICU staff, um, and we'll test for glucose, and um, we will then just include the drainage from the catheters and the fluid balance. Um, if the fluid, the, um, if the pleural fluid is not causing um, severe respiratory compromise. What happens if you insert a catheter into the bladder or the bowel? So I've done this a few times. So you can put the catheter in and suddenly the child's passing huge amounts of urine or you, or you get diarrhea. Um, in, this kind of, in this case, you need to seek a surgical opinion. Um, if the bowel injury is suspected that there are no clinical signs of peritonitis, then you, can, you just pull the catheter out and you can monitor the child, child closely for, um, for peritonitis and add antibiotics that you would use for intra-abdominal sepsis. So antibiotics like Augmentin or Pyptase and Amic or uh, Miropenem are suitable antibiotics for that. Um, but generally speaking, if the surgeons don't feel there's a need to surgically repair the per uh, perforation, then um, once you pull the catheter out and the child seems fine, you can actually just insert a new catheter and carry on going. So generally with these small catheters, just inserting the needle into the bowel is usually not too problematic. Um, peritonitis rates vary widely on, in, in different studies from about 4 to 80 percent. Um, and we, there's no specific guidelines for acute PD, so these are managed as per, per the chronic PD guidelines. Um, just remember that peritonitis may be masked by the patient's overall illness, especially on sedation and, a, on, and on a ventilator. Um, so it's quite a good idea to do a leukocyte count every one to three days. And there's actually some evidence to show that if you can use leukocyte esterase dipsticks daily, um, and some people in low-income countries have used this, this technique for, for monitoring for peritonitis. But you have a high index of suspicion for fungal peritonitis in, in ICUs. Um, so what about intra-abdominal pressure? Well, um, most picky recommendations are that intra-abdominal pressure should be measured in patients who have risk for abdominal compartment syndrome. And one of the risk factors they cite is using peritoneal dialysis, and this comes from the Abdominal Compartment um, Society. Didn't really know there was such a thing, but it is. And the definition of intra-abdominal pressure is a pressure um, of 14 centimeters of water or more. And um, this can be measured either directly through the, um, with a manometer through the, the PD catheter, or it can be measured through a bladder transducer, um, and which you can connect to the, the CVP transducer on the monitor. And um, this is quite useful. I find very useful. So I usually uh, will infuse 10 mils per kilogram of fluid and then actually measure the intraperitoneal pressure um, before I infuse the next 10, mil 10 mils per kilogram. Um, this is not much data on this. So this is just a study done from by Morris in 2004 on six patients showing with different full volumes of 10, 20, and 30. You can see the intraabdominal per intraperitoneal pressure goes up, but actually still below the the, the um, dangerous level. Um, in a study that we did on 13 patients, we had a mean intra-abdominal pressure of about 13 centimeters of water. So also generally okay. Um, what we did find when you use a bladder transducer, the pressures were 20% higher than if you measured directly um, from the 
ensure abdominal pressure. Um, if you have a raising abdominal pressure, you can you need to monitor ventilation. So if you've got uh, pressure ventilation, you can look at the mood volume. Um, and if, if that is decreasing, then you know there might be a, there's a problem with intra-abdominal pressure. Um, and what we do is we just decrease the volume incrementally by five mils per kilogram until you um, you have a pressure that is, is more uh, suitable and, and, and the ventilation is, is better. Um, and we also position the patient, the patient up in the 30, uh, 30 degrees head up position if you have this complication as well. And if you have hyperglycemia, which is a um, glucose of more than 20 millimoles per litre, um, the thing is to try and reduce the concentration in the PD, in the PD but that's not always possible. Um, but if, it's, so if that's not working or not possible, then we will usually start an insulin infusion of 0.05 international units per kilogram per hour. We also um, tell you for adding insulin to the PD gags, and you can look at these in the, in the guidelines. Remember that if you do peritoneal dialysis, you actually lose protein. And these are actually the, the amounts of protein that are lost in chronic peritoneal dialysis, and they include in the Kadoki Pediatric Nutrition Guidelines. Um, and for PD, you can use anything from 0.1 to 0.3 kilograms per kilogram per day, and this should probably be replaced in the child's diet. Um, actually, with, um, with acute PD, you probably lose a, a bit more than this, actually. In low, low birth rate and very low birth rate infants are, are suited to PD because most of the time you cannot get cats as big enough to do a CRRC in these patients um, or, or HD. Um, these are the prescriptions are a bit uncertain. This is a recent article by Bergmeister, who, Bergmeier, where they um, actually, somehow, actually um, gave some data on, the, on the low birth rate infants and also summarized the data. Um, and there's not a lot of data, there's only like 13 low birth weights and 13 extreme low birth weights infants um, altogether. Um, but in these, uh, it seemed like the most of the time the cat cook, cook cats are used, um, multi-purpose cook cats and uh, the PD, cook PD cats. Sometimes 10 cook cats and drainage tubes were used. Um, uh, vascular cats with manually made side holes were used and umbilical cats. The full volumes and um, dwell times used were actually similar to that what, what we recommend for older children. But the comment in this article is that, that probably lower full volumes and dwell times may be better. Um, so there's definitely need for further research in this group of patients. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank my colleagues at Red Cross Hospital. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Pete, for a fantastic talk. Um, very practical. And I think that's, that's what's great about the guidelines. And I urge you all to, to look at the guidelines. They're freely available through the ISPD website. Um, and through Peritoneal Dialysis International. Um, but they're practical and can be used by anyone from a low-income country to a high-income country. So thanks very much for that, Pete. We're going to move on now to Samson, who's going to, to tell us how he set up his program in, in Ghana um, and, and the trials and tribulations, really, of, of setting up an acute PD program and how many lives he's saved. So thanks, Samson. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, thank you very much, uh, Brett, and a uh, good day to everybody who is hearing me. So, um, my job this evening is just to share with you how I set up my peritoneal dialysis for acute kidney injury in Ghana. Um, I have no financial interest in any of the companies that will be mentioned in this presentation. Can I, can I move on? That's okay. Okay. So, um, Ghana is an emerging economy in West Africa with uh, close to 30.8 million people. Uh, until recently, the country was divided into 10 administrative regions, but now that has increased into 16. 
And a, a typical tropical country, malaria is very endemic in Ghana. And despite our number, over 30 million, um, we have only 11 adult nephrologists and four pediatric nephrologists. So that is a very big uh, challenge we have. And um, on the screen, I'm just showing you the four pediatric nephrologists. Two are in Kumasi, where are working at in the central part of Ghana, Arud. The other two are in the capital, Accra. So it tells you that there are a lot of areas in the country that are not covered. So I'm a beneficiary of um, Ipnia Fellowship. Um, I trained in Red Cross where Peter is working. Peter was one of my teachers and I'm Michael of Mignon. And I returned back to Ghana in 2009. Now, before my return, there was no previous PD services for children. Definitely not in Kumasi. I hear that Dr. Jumwa Adu had done some PD in Accra for adults um, before, but not in children. And so when I was returning from my training, and I came, um, I think Red Cross generously gave me two PD catheters. Uh, to come along with, but these were to be used to actually advocate for their purchase, so not meant actually to be used, uh, because commonly when you want to order this, they want you to show them a copy of what you have, and so that was what I was doing when I came. Uh, no PD solutions available in the country then. Sorry, next slide. Next slide, the slide is not moving. Uh, Samson, you are in charge of um, the presentation. I, I cannot do that. Yes. I'm trying to move it, but it's not moving. Just and try your side. error. OK, fine. So um, typical of when you go for training and return in a, a developing country like um, Africa, um, you have a lot of challenge because what you are coming to do has never been established. And so we faced some frustration. So when I came, I had to write a detailed training report to the hospital chief executive. And um, when I came the year after, I established that pediatric renal unit. So I wrote a lot of protocols, guidelines, and I put a renal team together, had four nurses at that time. And I started operating pediatric renal clinic. And I managed to convince the hospital to send two of my nurses for training in South Africa. They are all back and part of my team. So that was 2010. But just writing, writing protocols, I haven't gotten any solutions, any other consumables to start PD. But after I watched a couple of children die from AKI, I became frustrated. I said, no, something must be done. Um, so in 2010, I had a one-year-old child who had HUS. And I thought of, why not try and do improvised catheter for this child? And so I used the item that I display here. This is a chest stroker that I use. And then use a breast, as was mentioned by Peter, and um a formula that Red Cross gave to me that you can mix saline with dextrose, add bicarbonate to it to prepare PD solution. So I use this improvised catheter, self instituted the PD solutions, and I pe perform PD for that child. This is the um, constitution that was made, and this is uh, based upon a formula that Red Cross um, uh, had written. So to prepare a bicarbonate solution of 2.5%, use dextrose, uh, uh, normal saline, put bicarbonate into it, calcium gluconate, and hypertonic saline, and then I was good to go to make one liter dialysis solution. So that was done in 2010. And I remember I've said that PD had never been done before 
And so when I mentioned to people that I was going to do PD, there was a lot of excitement and news was going around that ah, Dr. MG is going to do peritoneal dialysis, but we only read about it in the books. So that is me trying to increase uh, the pulse uh, holes in the chest stroker. This is in the ICU setting. That was the child. And that was myself instituted solutions I made in an empty infusion bag. And that was the child there. And so we did that PD. That PD ran successfully for 31 days. And the child by chemistry actually improved markedly. Even though on day 31, the urine output was still low, less than 10 mils per day. The pre dialysis urea was 40 millibol, uh, creatinine was 895, pH was 7.2, uh, serum bicarbonate 8.1, and base excess of minus 19. On the 31 on PD, urea has come to 14, bicarbonate uh, creatinine reduced to 133, pH normalized 7.4. Serum bicarbonate 19.4 and base excess minus 4. However, remember the child continued to be oligoric. And that child died unexpectedly from what the anesthetist tell me was unknown um, um, upper area obstruction. It was painful, he died, he hasn't recovered renal function. But the PD ran very well. And amazingly, there was no peritonitis. This is improvised catheter and solution. So encouraged by this feat in 2011, I used the same improvised means, do more PD. And um, so this were case, you can all see this were improvised solutions. I had few standardized catheter, and, um, but the solution were improvised. And these four that I did the PD on, they all recovered renal function and they survived. And I must say that my first case that I did in 2010, I actually uh, presented it at uh, Ipnia, New York, 2010, presented an abstract on that. And uh, I recall one colleague from Tanzania reading that report and also replicating that in Tanzania. And so um, having successfully done this improvised Petroleum dialysis, the hospital management then got to know that they need to support me because I'll be able to change the situation. So the hospital managed to buy PD solutions for me. However, I couldn't get PD catheters. The difficulty you face is that when you write to the companies, cook and the rest, um, because of the small balloons that you are requesting, which way they don't even um, respond to your meals. So I was still faced with difficulty in getting catheters, even though the hospital has applied or purchased PD solutions for me. And so we formed a Ghana Kidney Association in 2011 and had our first AGSM. We had a lot of people invited from Europe, uh, Birmingham, Belarus, in Russia. And before they came, I sent a passionate appeal that if they can come with some PD catheter to donate to me, I'll be grateful. And they responded and they came with a number of PD catheters to help me. Remember, I had solutions. I had a friend from Belarus who even came with a five liter bag of PD solution. Amazing for me. But at the same conference, apparently, because of a presentation I've done in one of the conferences, uh, the then president of the ISN Sister Rena Center, one for Harding, saw my presentation and he, he talked about my situation to Mary Carter. That time they were working with the Rena Research Institute in the US. They have formed an NGO called Sustainable Kidney Care Foundation. So they came down to Ghana to look at my sites and they look at my potential. And when they came, took them to the CEO of my hospital, they signed MOU two years with my hospital to supply me with PD solutions and catheters. That was the MOU that was signed then. And um, this is the generosity of uh, Sustainable Kidney Care Foundation. They supply a lot of PD solutions and a lot of catheters, cook, and the chemo, a single calf chemo. So I was good to go, having been equipped 
with these consumables. But like their name indicates, Sustainable Kidney Care Foundation, when they signed the MOU, they were supplying these consumables to me for free for two years, but I was supposed to track the money. So that after they pull off, I'll be able to use the money to continue on the process. And that is very important for anybody who wants to set up a dialysis solution. And so at that exactly I did. I was tracking all the PDs I did. This is, and uh, of course, all the PDs we did were manual. You see, this is the closed system that Peter talked about. And this is uh, in the world, a manual PD we did for this child. And so I think I am um, SYL um save young life foundation came on board so my mou was extended from 2012 to 2016 and they continued to supply me pd catheters and solutions and over the period i did 80, 89 pds and the age range from five days weighing 2.2 kilograms to 30 year old weighing 30. and of course because they have come with these are the catheters, the Kimas and Gekab, we use them. We also have some Tenkov non carb catheters. We have the Ku catheters. In very small children, sometimes we use central lines. And of the 89 children, uh, there was a survival rate of 70%. That was very encouraging. Now, this is what I did. Every child that I'll do the PD on, we will track the inpatient number. The total bill that the patient had to pay, the components that was a deal for PD, their cash receipt, and if they have health insurance, health insurance number. By the way, Ghana has got a national health insurance. They will pay only for acute dialysis, but not chronic. And so I was able to track this. And during the period, we actually made about 72,878 Ghana CDs. This I showed to the hospital authority that these are monies that have been accrued because of the supply of free consumables by SYL and Sustainable Kidney Care Foundation. So having done that, the hospital had no option than to make sure that they made money available for me to continue with my purchase. And so, um, yeah, that's the amount of money we made. And the hospital management agreed to continue the purchase. And I must say that the hospital did very well and continued to actually purchase both catheters and PD solutions for me. That's how come that our program for acute uh, kidney injury has come to stay in Kumasi. So after Sustainable Kidney Care Foundation uh, pulled off the uh, SYL, the hospital has continued to make purchase for me. And uh, currently, let me say that PD is fully established in Kumasi, the hospital management fully on board. To date, we have done about 260 PDs with a survival a rate of 68%. And interestingly, uh, our peritonitis, they are all done manually. Peritonitis rate is quite low, um, uh, less than 50%. We haven't got local production of PD solutions yet. You know, because there's no chronic PD program in Ghana. And that is when manufacturers that they can make their money. So if you approach those companies that do produce flu, for them to make PD solution for you, they will ask me about what numbers are you looking at? And for pediatrics, when you are doing AKI, you can't talk about volumes. I'm in talk with my other colleagues to see whether they can also begin to do PD, chronic PD, so that we can actually um, get local production going. I must say that the solutions uh, Presenius has been reliable. Anytime you write to them, they will supply the solutions. But catheter supply has been very, very, very difficult. Sometimes you write, you don't get a response. But recently, I had a company in um, um, Canada. Um, I think they are good and they are able to supply us with abandoned catheters. And so that is the situation we have now. Now, in terms of training, um before i was the only person who was trained in pd performance of uh, pd uh but now i have one registrar who have just been qualified as a fellow 
uh, is fully trained in pediatric nephrology and it really he's the de facto head of the unit he does everything uh, uh, that's the pd that's a uh, 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 in my clinic we have gone on also to train district doctors because I told you where the uh, pediatric nephrologists are located. They are far away from the hinterlands. And sometimes they get very bad AKI. By the time they refer, the patient will die in the way. And so what we thought to do was to train district doctors and nurses, uh, physician assistants, how to perform emergency PD if they can't refer the child. The child is so bad, pulmonary edema. And to date, we have trained 150 uh, healthcare personnel, consisting of doctors, physician assistants and nurses. And information that um, we've gotten from them that all these people, they've managed to do about perform 48 peritoneal dialysis. These are not nephrologists, they're just district doctors. They perform 48 uh, PDs with uh, more than 50% survivor. Of course, uh, we give them a form to fail and, and feedback to us which most of them have not done. We only had uh, responses from 23 of them at eight different district hospitals. So there's not one district hospital, eight different district hospitals scattered across Ghana. They've done 48 peritoneal dialysis. And the 28, the 23 responses we got, uh, the survival rate was 60.9, which is very good. Uh, beyond that, our center has also been accredited by our postgraduate training college, Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, to even Trained pediatric nephrologists, uh, we are good to go. Even beyond the peritoneal dialysis that we are doing, uh, my hospital has gone on because now PD is fully established for AKI, not chronic. Um, they've gone ahead to purchase a hemodialysis machine for us. So we've established hemodialysis unit. The plan is to get chronic hemodialysis program uh, on board. Uh, however, Affordability is a major issue because chronic PD is not covered by insurance and most people cannot afford that. And so we have formed a parents association and we have gone ahead to actually uh, contact um, an organization and form a foundation we call Children's Dialysis and Kidney Transplant Foundation, uh, hoping that we can just appeal to philanthropists and NGOs to donate money to this association so that we can actually um, establish chronic PD for children by chronic hemodialysis. And uh, recently, we have been awarded sister, Ipina Sister Rina Center, um, a program we've seen done in uh, uh, Bangalore, uh, uh, India. We are hoping that they are going to help us lead our hands to achieve this chronic renal repair therapy that we want to do. So the take home message um, is that when you go for training and camp, you may have nothing to hold on to, but you must be passionate in what you want to do, and what you can do, persevere in it. Tell your stories, let people hear. If you get a least opportunity, tell your stories, and people will come into your aid. And uh, when you have been supported, you must demonstrate profitability to the managers. Because the managers are health institutions, if it is not profitable, they are not interested. And so you must demonstrate that you be able to recoup the money that they use to do the purchase for you. And documentation is so, so important. That I think one of our major, major, major anchors. You need to document everything you have, the cases you see, their survivors, and other things like that. So that is my uh, pediatric trainer team, myself there, and uh, the other doctor registrar who has been trained and actually um leading the charge when i'm not there another uh, doctor who is going to join uh, in january uh, as a trainee and then my nursing team that i have so that is the story i have i want to acknowledge my hospital management for their support i want to uh, acknowledge mary carter and john caligari uh, of the susan kidney care foundation and syl they supported me and of course from Macalog for being my teacher and also supporting me throughout this journey. Thank you very much. Thanks, Samson, for a truly inspiring talk. You, you really are an amazing individual and have achieved the most wonderful things, um, saving 
you know, so many lives. Um, what I find amazing is, is that you've managed to set it up so quickly in terms of the program. Um, you know, you had it up and running and, and extremely functional very quickly. You also have managed to train other people in out in the districts um, to do the PD, and I think that's you know that's a key is that you a lot of these patients never make it into the centres because they they die of their hyperkalemia before they can get transferred in um, in many of these these countries. Why don't you just uh, just tell us how how do you go about training those those fellows or um, doctors out in the community hospitals um, to do a QPD and how to put the catheters in? You're Sorry, Brett, I think there was a dip. I'm unmuted. No, I'm on. I'm on. I didn't get a question. I think there was a dip in your voice. Uh, can you come again? Okay. So I'm just saying that you've managed to train a lot of doctors out in the community, which is key Brett, to. Brett. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So just, just to ask you about training the doctors out in the community. I can hear you. Yeah. How do you go about how do you go about that? How do you teach them how to put the catheters in, and how have you gone about training them in acute PD? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, some of our trainees we had these standard catheters uh, with their insertion kit, and you see, it's very easy to teach anybody to do that. But we didn't have many of them, and so after the training, we give few to them, and uh, when they've exhausted it. They haven't got any. But you see, in the district hospital, they do laparotomies. These are doctors who are general, generous, but they do surgery. They do laparotomies. And so teaching them to do a mini lap and place any catheter they have, some use NG tube, some use uh, Foley's catheter. Um, it is easy for them to do that for them. And so all we teach them is to have to make the mix, the flow, uh, fluid, maintaining sepsis, the exchanges, and all the things to look for. Uh, most often when they do it, they are always in touch with us. If they have any difficulty, they actually run almost 24 hours consultation with us. If they have difficulty, we, we teach them do this, do that, do that. So most of them, if they haven't got the standard catheter that we pass by the setting up uh, uh, technique, then they use any um, catheter they have uh, by a mini lab, which they are able to do because they do all kind of laparotomies in their district. And so they put it in there. Remember, this is acute. And most often, within a week, the child has recovered. So that's what we do. But if we get the standard catheters, it will be great. We can let a lot more people do it. But the problem is that it's difficult to get it. If probably SYL will be kind enough, you can give me a thousand catheters. I can go out there, distribute. I can tell you to be great, great for, for Ghana and probably even beyond Africa, wherever you want us to train people, we can do that. That's fantastic, and you and you highlight the point that that in many places people are having to use makeshift catheters and makeshift fluids, um, and it's something that we we train on the Saving Young Lives course um, how to mix these and um, and and how to put these catheters. And and Peter, you you um, in your talk we're, we're talking about these makeshift catheters and makeshift fluids, and one of the questions um, that's come to us, and it's 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 amazing seeing where the questions are coming from this this webinar. We've got people from Cambodia through Africa through to Argentina. Um, so congratulations to the organisers for putting this together. Um, but Peter, just to to ask the question. Um, so with these makeshift catheters, one of the questions is if you've got a, a Foley's catheter or a nasogastric tube, um, just how you keep it in place. But also, if you could just just reiterate um, mixing the, the solutions, you know how we how we go about that. Yeah, so um, I think Samson probably answered this question more than us. Or actually, he's he's had good catheters, but um, most of the time you actually just strap these catheters down. I think is um, if you like we would with normal PD. So our PD catheters would be used a soldering and technique. We actually just use um, uh, tape and, and actually strap these catheters to the abdominal wall. Um, so if you're using a, it seems like an intercostal drain or whatever else you're using, then 
that is um, is, is what you would do, I think. Um, Mina might actually have answer it better than me because I think she's she's seen a bit more of this than me, actually. Yeah, so I'm just going to introduce yeah. Minyam because she's come on. She she's labelled as Brett Cullis, but that's um, Professor Minyam McCulloch from um, from Cape Town. She's head of the Pediatric Nephrology Department at the University of Cape Town. I think she's known by all of you in pediatrics um, throughout the world. Um, she's done a huge amount of teaching and training, um, but also done a huge amount of um, pediatric. Um, uh, AKI, and she is on the Saving Our Lives Steering Committee and a, a huge member of it, um, training people around the world. So, Minion, you've got a lot of experience. What do you think? Uh, thank you very much, Brett. I should be so lucky to be Brett Cullis. So I aspire to being there. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I just want to say, firstly, I think we need to be warriors and advocates, and Samson has definitely shown that. You need to tell your medical managers and your hospital administration that money needs to be spent on AKI. And I see building up a charity is definitely the way to go, because there is money in most countries. So building a charity to try and get money for catheters is great. With Bashir Admani, we recently ran a AKI workshop at the Kenyan Renal Society um, meeting. And it seems that adult central lines are easier to come by than soft catheters. And those are put in by solving a technique. Um, and you have two ports, you have an in and an out port, and you can actually just fit them to the abdominal wall after you put them in by solving a technique. So I think where people can't get cook catheters or they can't get uh, peel away tank offs, if you use a big adult central line, so a 12 or a 14, you can put that into the abdomen and use that as a PD catheter. And for some strange reason, there seems to be a lot of adult central lines and not other kinds of catheters. So that's just a, a little tip. Obviously, chest strains, nasogastric tube, everything else we've mentioned, and whatever you do must be done in a sterile fashion. So even mixing your fluid should be done in a sterile fashion. And with that, we've actually done that ourselves at Red Cross and had a 4% peritonitis rate. So very, very low. Um, while you've been speaking, Samson, I've written back to one of the companies, Cook, and said, please, can they try and supply us with catheters? But just to let you know, they're about to discontinue the straight cook catheters, but they will keep the pigtails going. So we need to try and get the pigtails um, far and wide. But in the absence of that, I think most places have central lines. And I've even seen people in the Philippines using adult central lines for premature babies. So all is not uh, lost if you don't have the proper equipment. You just need to make sure that you use a sterile technique. Thanks, Minion. And so just you, when you're talking about adult central lines, you're talking about adult hemodialysis catheters. I know so hemodialysis or even adult central lines um, because they are much bigger ball, much bigger size than you would be. So the Cook catheter we tend to use is an eight fridge. Um, and the biggest in feeds, the biggest catheter we would use in an ICU setting would be a 5.5. So in adults, you may use a 7, 8, or 9 even for a central line, not even for a hemoline. Hemoline, obviously, better for the catheter. So any adult central line, even if it's not a hemoline, it's a bigger catheter than an 8 French on the whole. So uh, we would actually, you know, uh, um, Bashir and I were just chatting and just saying it really is difficult. And the Romsons, which Pete also described, very cheap, $10. So it's really hard to beat that price. But those rigid catheters can cause bowel damage. If you've got nothing else, you may be forced to use it. But we've had lots of bad experiences with it. So we're trying to look for something soft and something seldinger that, that would be a good alternative. And you, you mentioned your mixing your solutions and your low peritonitis rates. There's also um, we, you know, data come from DRC. Um, from um, from Cameroon as well, and um, also that mixing your if you mix your baby solutions at the bedside or in an even more sterile environment, as long as you do it very carefully, your peritonitis rates are are really low, and it's going to save lives. You know this is the whole thing with PD and AKI, especially in low uh, income countries. You may not have the the ideal catheter, you may not have the ideal solutions. Um, but you can see from the data that Samson's yeah, produced, yeah. data from the Saving and Life program, you know, even with mixing solutions and using makeshift catheters, we're still getting 65, 70% survival. 
and those children wouldn't have, wouldn't have survived if, if it hadn't been done. So um, even if you are short of, of supplies, as long as you do it carefully, you can save lives. I think that's really important. Yeah, and I mean, we've shown some pharmacies would want to do it in a laminar flow setting. When we use that study with bicarb, we used Belsol and um, dextrose, and we actually just made sure it was all opened on a sterile tray, and we did it at the bedside. So um, it is all about making sure that all your connections are sterile, you wearing the full gear. And COVID has done us a favor in that it's taught people how to wear PPE properly. Um, so my motto is never allow a child to die of AKI without at least an attempt of acute PD. So, and I think the guys like Samson who've done so many of these cases really has, has shown that. So I really applaud you, Samson, and all your colleagues that are working in Ghana. I still say Samson will be president of Ghana one day, but um, thank you for being such a fantastic advocate. <laughs> So we, we, we are hoping Samson doesn't become president yeah. of Ghana today because it's going to it's going to a whole lot of children are going to going to die. So, um, but but but, but Brit, Brit, how, how how can I get there? I need to become a politician before I can get there. I'm not a politician, you understand. But what Binyan said, I think we should not be very much afraid. If you make it your point to make sure you maintain a sterile um, atmosphere. In putting the solution together, you are down, you wear all your sterile distance. Peritonitis is quite low. And the exchange is to. Um, so we follow a bit of the precautions that are written in the outline. For example, we always change the bedding of the child because we do it on the best side. When they call you, we just go there and do it. We will change the bedding, the, uh, uh, the sheets that the child is wearing, probably make sure that he, uh, the child is. Uh, giving a bit of a bath and then we give um, antibiotics an hour before we do it we put antibiotics into this and we make sure that people we have um, a sterilizer uh, alcohol attached to the bed of the patient if you are going to do the exchanges make sure you change your hand uh, you rub your hands so if you are meticulous first in its own instance like i'm saying one week when the child is urinating and so your rate of peritonitis will see because this is acute. It's not like a chronic I'm going to do for a, a, a man. This is yeah. And um, some of the challenges we face, if you use improvised catheters, it will secure it in place. And uh, actually, in some instances, we've had the catheters falling off. But most often, when the child comes and is so sick, uh, acidotic, it's not moving. And then the catheter will be in place. By the time they are kicking and uh, the catheter falls off, they Urine is coming. You have this kind of experience. The urine has started <laughs> coming, and so we save the child. So I think when we are meticulous, we are able to do these things. Make sure you use, you don't cut corners. Use there are um, a procedure to make your fluid and all your exchanges. Do the same. And uh, we use pair string just to keep the catheters in place uh, and make sure that it is not pulled on. These simple, simple things. My focus is, is acute. For acute. You can save a lot of the children from dying. I had senses zero by 25, and this is the way to go. Otherwise, if you want the standard thing before we can do a PD, um, it will not happen, and a lot of people will die needlessly. Uh, Samson, I completely agree with you. Okay, we've got, I think we're going to carry on for just one more question. We have gone over time, but um, I'm glad to see that that most attendees have, have stayed on, which shows, shows how interested people are in this topic. Uh, Peter, one last question for you, just in terms of glucose and concentration of glucose in the bags. You know, do you think we should be starting, when do you decide between using a 1.5% solution, 2.5, 4.25? What's your rule of thumb? So generally speaking, we tend to start with a 2.5 solution um, most of the time. That's what I generally start with. But it does uh, depend on the clinical situation. So if you've got someone who's um, hasn't got a big problem with fluid, um, but you want to just stylize them, then then you might want to start with 1.5. Um, and what we do, we do we'll sometimes mix them. So we might have a 1.5 solution, and then we'll alternate that with a 2.5 because those PDP systems have two connections. So you can actually um, you can do 1.5 and then alternate with 2.5, or then you can go 2.5, and then sometimes you can alternate with 4.25 if you if you need to do that as well. But 
but generally I'm fine I start with 2.5 percent so that because it's the kind of go to yeah. and I just it's just to reiterate with you. Yeah. yeah go for it Minya I was just going to say, so often in kids, they get a lot of fluid when they're very sick. They get 120 mils per kilo. And the advantage of having glucose in their belly at 2.5% is you can then really cut back their maintenance fluid right down to 60 mils per kilo and they decrease your fluid overload. And I think that's sort of a, a good side effect of having glucose in the belly. Um, and that's something that we've actually found as well. So if you're running a lot of glucose into the peritoneum, you can then cut back your maintenance fluid, and that'll often stop the child from becoming completely fluid overloaded. So it's a, it's a good side effect. And I think just to, to highlight, you know, people, people worry with PD that we've always been taught with chronic PD, don't use high glucose solutions can damage the membrane. In pediatrics, it doesn't matter. So you must use the correct concentration of glucose to achieve the ultrafiltration that you need. So don't be scared to use higher concentrations of glucose. Yeah, I said, so you know, I think it's important use that to get the ultrafiltration. Even if you have to, you have to use insulin to get the the, um, the blood glucose down. Um, but it's important to try and get the ultrafiltration. Is much more important than than worrying too much. Worrying about the, the peritoneum and acute dialysis is not really relevant. Right. Just a last comment. Um, people are not anxious to give, to, to put uh, acidic drains in. People often stick a needle into the peritoneum to drain ascites, but they're very nervous to do it. And I think Samson has really shown that you can train people to do this safely um, right across you know the world. So that's kind of our aim. Is it's less to safe PD and with ultrasounds. It will be interesting to see how people start using ultrasounds and PD catheters as well. Excellent. Well, on that note, I would just like to thank um, Peter for giving us the guidelines and for producing the guidelines, which is no, no uh, short feat. Um, Minion was also a co-author on those guidelines. So thank you, Peter, for a fantastic talk. Samson, for inspiring us and everyone around the world as to, as to how amazing um, you've been and, and what amazing work you've done and really showing us that we, we can achieve this. And thank you also to Lucy Szymanska from um, IFNA for putting together this um, workshop today. Um, thank you all and hope you have a good evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.